for um, SLS and we're very excited today to bring you this webinar from one of our supply partners UVTEC on epifluorescent applications in their gel, gel imager systems. So we're joined today by um, Sasha Sapford from UVTEC who'll be taking you through their portfolio and technologies and also we're really excited to welcome Dr Philip Hansen from Cellematics who will be taking you through um, how they've used these systems in their lab um, for in-cell western applications. So just a bit of housekeeping. Timings wise we're looking at sort of 30 minutes for Sasha to go through the UVTech portfolio and then we'll be passing over to Dr Hansen to take you through uh, the Cellematics work for about 20 minutes. So we should have time about 10 minutes at the end of the hour for questions. Your audio and video should be muted automatically. Um, so if you've got any questions that you want to pop in the chat, I'll be there sort of manning that um, and we, we can address those at the end. Uh, but please, the, we, just, we will have time for those at the end. Um, and also this webinar is being recorded. So if you do want a copy of it, at the end, um, your colleagues have missed for any reason, please reach out. That will be made available to you. So I'll pass over to Sasha. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I understand it's uh, the afternoon in, in England. So um, I will share my slides with you all. Um, hopefully this works. Has this worked successfully? Perfect. Yeah, we're seeing that. You're seeing? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining in today. Um, as as you're well aware, we'll be talking about epifluorescence, and uh, um, as Katie has mentioned, uh, I'll answer with Philippe, Dr. Hansen, all the questions that need to be answered at the end of this this webinar. But today, it's, it's just going to be discussing about um, e epi against chemifluorescence. In particular, I'll be presenting the method, uh, what it involves, and uh, I've given here two specific uh, troubleshooting case scenarios, which I think. Are quite nice and I'll make this quite interactive so if you want to pop in your answer at some point please do not hesitate and then obviously I'll be talking about our loud sources and the software that we use at UVTech before leading to uh, Dr Hansen who will discuss um, his recent experiments um, uh, using Incel Western for our systems. So for most of you, uh, all of you are very conscious regarding uh, Western blotting. Obviously this is a technique which is quite precise and it's used to be able to detect uh, a protein of interest that we're wanting to look at. And particularly this uh, method that was first introduced in 1979 by uh, Tobin uh, was uh, used using chemiluminescence, which is a very straightforward method. It's very low cost, it's very sensitive. It's actually a lot more sensitive than epifluorescence, 100 times more, and I'll explain to you why. But um, as such, it's very common to use this. However, when it comes to chemiluminescence, the only a uh, little troubleshooting issue with this is that we can only really study one protein at a time and uh, the signal durability is quite short. It's a uh, couple seconds to a couple minutes depending on, on the reagents we use. As such, um, fluorescent western blotting was introduced um, to answer these little um, dilemmas which were present in chemiluminescence. Um, just a little fun fact that was introduced by a German scientist, August Kohler, in 1888. Um, and actually a lot of our basic principles of fluorescence uh, are based off his studies. And uh, today, uh, this is what we have today. And as such, uh, first and western blotting um, answers these two problems I mentioned to you before, as the reaction of uh, epifluorescence are much longer. Um, they can last weeks to months. And the other day, I actually even tested out a blot which was two years old. Um, just to show you the length of time it lasts. And also this idea of multiplexing. So this idea that we can study multiple proteins um, at the single time. So um, just to present some uh, differences in terms of the two techniques for those who haven't uh, yet uh, been introduced to epifluorescence. Uh, for those who have worked on chemiluminescence, it is an enzymatic reaction. And as such, the sensitivity is a lot greater than that of uh, epifluorescence. The reason uh, for why this is, is um, the reaction that occurs uh, between the luminol, for example, that we use, is gonna be a direct correlation to the concentration of the protein, whereas epifluorescence uses a fluorophore, which is um, uh, and not an enzymatic reaction, but dependent on the excitation source that will be used. And as such, the sensitivity is not as great. 
not least to say is that now with the introduction of uh, infrared and near infrared, uh, we're able to obtain similar um, sensitivity. More particularly, this idea with epifluorescence is that, as I said to you before, um, the signal duration is quite long, and this idea of multiplexing studying multiple proteins at a single time. And you're probably curious to know why I've got this frog on the bottom of my screen. Um, it's a little fun fact for today, but um, this frog, it's called a polka dot frog, the Hypsoboas punctatus. It's from Argentina, and it's the only um, a terrestrial animal known to fluoresce, and we don't know why, um, but there are presumed there's uh, the guesses that it's to do with sexual predation. And you can see in the on the left side this green male, and on the blue side the female. So the idea that I wanted to show to you here is that epifluorescence um, can be a very simple technique in terms of observation and determining what we're looking at based on color. And so. Um, in this next part, which is where I spend most of my session today, um, is discussing the method. Most of you are curious to why I've got this photo on the left side, but for those who have uh, ever read any French comic books, there's a common uh, book known as Asterix and Obelix, and uh, they have a, a special potion uh, called the Magic Potion. And epifluorescence, I like to say, is a bit like this because uh, everyone doesn't know what we're going to be doing, and it's only till we discover what it is uh, by doing it. And particularly, I want to draw your attention to step four and step seven. Uh, the reason for why is because uh, when it comes to understanding the difference between chemi and epifluorescence is regarding the dilution of our secondary antibodies in particular. Because I have encountered a lot of times where people have considered that the chemiluminescent dilutions that they do are the same to that of epifluorescence, but it's not. And it's important uh, to really be careful with this and, and as such um, to make sure that when we uh, receive a, an antibody from a manufacturer to make sure we follow the guidelines um, and the reason in particular I address this is because the biggest problem when it comes to epifluorescence is controlling autofluorescence, uh, whether that comes from the membrane, whether it comes from the dye, whether that comes from just simply touching it with your hands. And as such, this next part here that I want to present is just a few little tips that I've gained over the years uh, from doing these experiments experiments, but also the discussions that I've had with uh, various scientists all over the world in terms of improving uh, their epifluorescent Western blot in particular. So the first one uh, that comes to mind is transfer conditions. I had a client in India once um, who I discussed with who had a problem where they uh, couldn't see their protein and they had done everything correctly. They were surprised and they thought maybe it was a problem with the antibody, maybe it was a problem with the reagents they were using, um, but it wasn't. And, and the simple tip he provided to me was, uh, since he was working with such a uh, weak protein, what he found, which was quite interesting, was that he would actually leave the um, his membrane after the transfer dry on his bench or he would place it in the incubator, uh, either on his bench for an hour or in the incubator at 37 degrees for uh, 10 minutes. And he found that this actually increased protein retention on his membrane and as such uh, had advised me maybe to do this in future experiments. And so this is one little uh, tip that I had learned, which was uh, quite useful. But if, if you do not observe your protein, despite having done everything correctly. The second and um, a quite important one is uh, for a lot of people who do Western blotting is deciding which membrane is the best. Uh, commonly, uh, people use PVDF or nitrocellulose, and as you can see in this bar graph, in our red lane we have uh, a PVDF membrane, and in our grey we have um, a nitrocellulose membrane. On the uh, x-axis we have our different wavelengths, so 532 corresponding to green, 635 for red, 700 and 800 corresponding to near and infrared uh, wavelengths. And then on our y-axis, we have our relative fluorescence, which is the amount of autofluorescence uh, coming from these uh, membranes. And what's quite interesting, and this is a study that was taken in 2018, was that uh, based on uh, the wavelengths, PVDF tended to have quite uh, a higher uh, level of autofluorescence in comparison to nitrocellulose, particularly in the green and in the red uh, uh, wavelengths. And 
the reason that came down to this is because PBDF has um, a very a superior protein binding uh, capacity compared to nitrocellulose and as such uh, affected uh, this autofluorescence. And, and, and as a result, I tend to actually recommend PBDF for chemiluminescence, but everyone has their own uh, protocol and standard. But what was more interesting um, was that recently, um, about three weeks ago, I, I actually went to Amsterdam and I met a client who was working on on, mem on auto, uh, epifluorescence. And I had asked him what membrane he was using, and he had actually recommended me the PVDF uh, non uh, autofluorescent membrane, which has been recently uh, put forth. And I don't know if this is something that you've used, but he mentioned that he for his case scenario with his proteins in particular that had worked better. So this is now the modern and uh, new options that are coming onto the market today. Uh, but as you can see, obviously coming back to this graph, this difference in the autofluorescence from our membranes and PVF and nitrocellulose isn't as significant to that of the green and in the red. So um, in France, and uh, I think most of you maybe in the UK have heard of this expression of this is not a pipe uh, in French, it's ceci n'est pas une pipe, which is a, a very common um, expression to say that everything is not what it represents. Um, and this analogy is, um, I'm making reference to the antibodies. All our antibodies come in very similar tubes, if not the same kind of looking tubes, and it's very easy to confuse and to, to mix uh, different uh, antibodies with whatever we're doing. And so it's very important, as I mentioned in the first little uh, part of my webinar, <clears throat> that when we look at antibodies and secondary antibody in particular for epifluorescence is to ensure that uh, we are using the uh, correct amount uh, that has been recommended by the manufacturer or that you have tested beforehand uh, yourself by doing dilutions and testing out the best um, uh, concentration that is required for your particular protein. <clears throat> then often I have people who've come up to me saying, Sasha, um, what do I do? Do I use PBS? Do I use TBS? What's better? Um, well, it doesn't really matter for epifluorescence to stay the same. However, I, I, do, I do mention that if you are working with phosphorylated proteins in particular, um, that you definitely do not want to use uh, PBS as this can interfere obviously with with your reaction. But I also commonly have people asking me what kind of blocking agents do I do I use? Do I use BSA? Do I use milk? Do I use PVP or gelatin? What 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 do you prefer? What's the tendency in today's uh, world? And um, in general, um, I, and I've carried some little tests to do this. Uh, I tried out BSA and the autofluorescence in all these channels was quite low, um, but the efficiency it, I found uh, wasn't as significant um, to that of milk, for example. It was actually quite similar to the efficiency of PVT and gelatin. Gelatin was quite good, um, but I tended to find in the blue channel, um, in particular at 520 nanometers, that there was quite a significant amount of autofluorescence uh, being um, present as a result of this uh, um, particular blocking agent. And as such, I decided not to go forth with this. And also PVP showed quite good results. But what has been uh, the best and the most cost effective uh, blocking agent was the use of milk. Um, it tended to be the best option. Um, however, I did tend to find at times, this is maybe with the protein I was working on at the time, that uh, at the 700 nanometer, so near the uh, near infrared um, wavelength, a bit of autofluorescence was being caused. But the reason for why, I don't know. Maybe there are specific molecules within the milk which which were autofluorescing at that, at that point of time. And commonly, I've, I've always asked and I've always been interested to know whether uh, or not uh, the washing buffer or different washing buffers, what can be used. And, and particularly, uh, I've had questions regarding Twin 20. Uh, I know that a lot of other manufacturers, such as uh, Lycor, for example, in particular, uh, do not recommend uh, using uh, this particular uh, buffer, and I, I, I completely disagree. Um, and uh, the reason for why is I found that it is true um, that autofluorescence can be a problem, but by imaging and by using this, we actually reduce the background noise in particular, and by imaging wet, this autofluorescence is avoided. And so I do tend to recommend using this, but obviously at a certain uh, uh, dilution. I've also had people once ask me whether or not Tris X100 could be used. Um, I disrecommended it um, just because there are components, fluorescent components, uh, 
in inside the actual uh, uh, buffer and as such I tend to this recommend just to prevent any cause of ex, uh, additional autofluorescence that may be present. And the last one is SDS and uh, and uh, I've had people say yes I've used it some people saying no I haven't used it um, so uh, this is up to you but in in general it does assist with the non-specific binding and, and uh, haven't really seen a problem with autofluorescence. And the final one, and this might be the most obvious one, is keeping a clean bench. Uh, the amount of times I've uh, travelled and I've <laughs> visited various labs and they've come up to me saying, Sasha, Sasha, I've got so many problems with my autofluorescent blot, it's not appearing correctly, what am I doing wrong? And then I would just have a simple look at their uh, lab desk and then I would see all these tubes everywhere and I would look at the blot and there'll be a fingerprint on it and I'd say well uh, maybe by cleaning your bench it might help first. So just a very simple and easy uh, task to do to make sure. Um, so in terms of my next uh, part of my uh, webinar I just wanted to present you two case scenarios. Um, in particular this first one um, which I invite you to answer in the chat if you like. I can't see the chat myself, so Katie uh, or, or Sarah, please do not hesitate to let me know if there are some answers in the chat. But um, in this case scenario, um, we can see a few dark you know, holes in this blot. I don't know if you can observe this. Um, and um, this was done in the US and they were quite surprised and they were coming up to me saying, Sasha, what, what, has, what has been done with this blot? Um, does anyone actually have a guess um, from the options that are provided here um, on my screen? I invite you to put that in the chat. Katie, do you want to have a guess yourself or not? I'm going to guess air, bubble, air bubbles, Sasha. Not bad, not bad. Okay, is there any answers or do I continue? Because if not, I will continue. Uh, there's nothing else in the chat so far, okay. so continue, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll keep going, I'll keep going. Well, for those who, who have shied away, do not hesitate, we are not many, so this is very interactive. The answer was not bad, Katie. Air bubbles is what I thought at first, um, but it actually came down to the apparatus, the actual transfer pads that they were using. Um, you're probably sitting there curious, sitting there, why? How? how is that the case? The membrane does not touch the pads. So that's very true. What I found was that the pads that they were using were 10 years old, um, and uh, actually what was happening was when they would... Um, place the blow inside with their filter papers, obviously, for the transfer, and they would put the pads down onto the, the filters. What would happen is that since the pads were so old and they were quite uh, uh, non, non, not very clean, let's say, uh, they actually had stuck the filter and as such had absorbed or gone through to the, to the actual membrane, and the membrane had actually stuck with the filter paper to the pads. And so when they removed it, the client or the person couldn't actually see the membrane having those little holes. And so when they did the transfer and went to the imaging, they resulted in these images where they had these dark spots in their blood in their blood. And so the simple solution to this was by simply cleaning your um, pads. And that was I we used 100 percent methanol to clean those pads. And there was this nice, beautiful yellow liquid that was coming outside of these these pads. So beautiful lunch we had. But um, this is uh, a very simple um, word of advice is to make sure that uh, you really want to uh, have clean material and it doesn't have to be new, but just clean to ensure that uh, we avoid all these possible uh, troubleshooting cases and errors that I see here. Okay, my next one, and I'm probably going to invite Dr. Hansen to have a guess at this, but um, this one was taken at Louis Pasteur Institute in, in Paris. Um, and this client in particular was their first time they were working on uh, epifluorescence, and they decided to do uh, multiplexing. So this idea of, of observing multiple proteins at the single time. Dr. Hansen, do you want to have, have a shot at guessing? There are two possible answers with this one. I, you're more than welcome. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Right, so let me, I didn't even read the options. <laughs> um, so there's definitely like a lot of background on that, on that membrane. Yes, that's right. Um, so I would say mm, there's definitely high concentration of, of some sort of antibody, I would say secondary antibody. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the only option there. There's, I think there's other problems there as well beyond <laughs> the antibody. But, <laughs> But yeah, I yeah. think the biggest one would be the secondary antibody. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Does anyone else, is there anyone else in the chat that put an answer? I'm not going to put pressure on you. I know it's Thursday afternoon. Um, 
I'll keep going. Well, thanks, Dr. Hansen, for the answer. Uh, you've replied perfectly well. So um, yes, the answer was to do with the secondary antibody in particular, um, but we did also find it was to do with the washing. So had come we came to this conclusion with that regard to the antibody? Well, as you can tell, um, in particular, how we noticed there was an aggregation of secondary antibody uh, was when we actually examined uh, the wells. We can see in the ladder where the red um, in the first lane, we have these green uh, you know, blots or, or indicators at the bottom indicating that the, um, uh, the secondary antibody actually aggregated over to the next well and caused this uh, beautiful pore, this pore image, let's just say, of our protein. And so as such, uh, we had to dilute down our secondary body. And while we're at it, we actually diluted also the primary just to be 100% sure. And the reason why the other answer came down to the washing, and, and some of you might have thought blocking as well, which is perfectly reasonable too. But the reason why we came down to this idea is because as you can see on the membrane, we have this green uh, light that or green fluorescent light that completely uh, takes over the whole entire membrane. And so this is a great indicator that the um, that the membrane was actually poorly washed. And so uh, in this case scenario, we introduced uh, 2020 to actually clean the membrane. Um, and uh, we actually washed the membrane a few more times to make sure that this was not a problem anymore. So I have I have a few more case scenarios, but I haven't presented them all for the reasons that we have. I have to do a short one today to let Dr. Hansen talk afterwards. Um, and for my last little part before I talk, give over to Dr. Hansen eventually, uh, I wanted to present you the light sources and the software in a, in a nice example. Um, and when I talk about light source, I'm not talking about Pink Floyd's brilliant album, uh, which I hope you've all listened to. Today, um, we have nine different options, which I think eight are shown here, and seven of which can actually be fitted inside our system. So it means you really can access as many uh, possibilities as possible. So in this next part, and this is my last final part before I hand over to Felipe, because I think I'm running out of time, um, I've got two videos. The first video is an example of um, my software for multiplexing, where I demonstrate to you how fast and how well we do um, our multiplexing capacity. And the second one is a quantification video. So in this video, as you can see here, I have a nice little dot plot, which I have inserted on our software. And on the left hand side, you can see these different options. We have the option, of, of, the option to do chemi, to do UV, to use screen, which is for Kamasi in particular. And we have blue or more, where we can select our desired uh, wavelengths. So in this particular case, I have selected uh, blue at 460 nanometers, and I have already start, uh, made a pre uh, made protocol for this, which can be easily done. Once I'm happy, you know, selected the right filters, I press auto and then start. Once I press this, the camera for the next two seconds will consider how long the exposition time is needed. In this case scenario, it's saying 2.3 seconds. And once it's done this, it will take my photo in 2.3 seconds, resulting in this image that we have below here. We can also go into 3D mode to be able to visualize it. Um, but more importantly, we can see also on the left side, these gray levels, which are very important for quantification. You can also, if you want to, make it automatic, but in this case, no, I haven't, but you can also color your blot into blue uh, to represent the wavelength that you want for uh, publication, for example. In this next case scenario, I have done a little multiplexing video where I have combined the blue and the red channel into this protocol called Multi. Once I'm happy with that and I've set up everything correctly, I just press auto and start. Once that's done, again, it's going to take a photo of my blue, uh, uh, my blue dye, my blue dot, and then it will automatically uh, fil uh, filter to the red and take a photo of my red channel. I think this took a, a few more seconds as well. And once that's done, I have three different photos. I have my first photo, which combines uh, my photo here of my two different colors, which I can close. This will be in a JPEG format as a result of the combination of two photos. But the other two photos that you have will be in TIFF, and these photos are, you will be able to use for your analysis and do anything that you need to do with this. So this is just to show you an example of how the software works and how fast it is to actually do our software now uh, imaging with uh, multiplexing. For this next part, I have a nice video of uh, quantification 
for you, for many, most of you who work on probably Kimmy lessons. So here, what I've done is I've just opened a recent Western blot that I took, and I accessed my analysis page, which is quantification. In this case scenario, I have a tab where I can move my bar to select uh, the region I want to actually study for my protein. Uh, once I'm happy with this area, I simply press next. It will take me to this rolling ball effect. And so this rolling ball effect is, is quite important because this will remove background noise. Uh, it's a part of the algorithm of the software. Um, and then I'll have to select again the, the bands that I want to look at. Once I've selected all the bands that I'm happy with, I can go to the next page providing me this final tab. And this final tab will include uh, these different numbers, and you're probably asking yourself what the hell do these mean? So the volume is the um, sum of all the pixel intensity within that defined area, whilst the height is the um, density, well, highest pixel density within that defined area. And then we have the area here, which is representative of the number of pixels within that area. And then this volume percentage is in reference to a, a protein marker. So for example, in this case scenario, I've indicated that lane a is my protein marker, and so everything will be done in volume in comparison to that uh, marker that I have indicated to the system. But you can mainly uh, put that in place if you want. So for your information, if you would like, you can always import these kind of information to an Excel sheet um, to be able to save this data for future times. You can also save the actual photo that you have here as well to the next pad. Okay, and I think there's a I think there's a little last part where I show this little part of 3D, but I think I don't have to skip that. Wonderful. So for to 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 finish, so I can leave uh, Dr. Hansen present his his part. Uh, we have a system which is very um, uh, capable of great detection, and it really avoids the issue of crosstalk, background noise, and autofluorescence. And just to show you a recent paper, I uh, met this uh, client in Iran who wanted to test um, in vivo his fluorophores because uh, a common problem in, in today's research is that a lot of uh, fluorophores used um, are quite toxic. Uh, and particularly uh, when working in in vivo. And so this client wanted to test out different uh, fluorophores that he made himself. And um, he had used uh, our system to determine this, and he determined using um, his um, research that this particular uh, protein of interest could actually localize within the liver of the, of the mice, and so he could diagnose the tumor. And so to finish up, um, what's very important is uh, our system, Q9 Alliance, has an aperture of 0.8. And the reason I highlight this is because it will be very important uh, in the lead up of Dr. Hansen's uh, presentation, as this is uh, very important in terms of detection, in terms of sensibility. As the smaller the number, the more uh, open your camera lens will be, and as such, the more sensitive your system will be. And this is uh, we're one of the only ones in the market today to be able to have this aperture. So I hope today uh, you were able to learn a bit more about multiplexing and, and quantitative Western blotting, and that mistakes happen and it's completely normal. And uh, we're always here to learn and to make things better. And that uh, with our pulse light system, that you'll be able to uh, answer the needs that you need to. So I thank you very much, and I will stop my presentation. I hope I haven't gone over time, and I'll let uh, Dr. Hansen take the uh, the rest of this webinar. Thank you, Sasha. That was like quite very informative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me just share it then. Da -da -da. Okay. I don't know if you can you can you all see? Yes, it looks great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me just wait, sorry. It's not going properly with me. <laughs> uh, OK. All right. So yeah, so thank you, everyone, uh, for joining in. So I'm Philip Penson. Uh, I'm a bioassay scientist at Salomatics. And like Sasha said, today I'm here to talk about um, in Cell West, an application uh, that we have developed here at Salomatics uh, using the UVTech system, uh, the UVTech system and uh, equipment of the Alliance Q9. Um, and just to, them, just to show an example of how can it be used in this case for Incel Western. So I'll give an overview what it is in Incel Western, how we use it and why we used it. And also uh, just a brief uh, overview of what we do here at Salomatics. 
So uh, here at Cellmatix, uh, we are uh, based at Nottingham, so we're UK based, and we are a, a team of very qualified scientists with several experience, uh, several years of experience of in vitro bioassays. Um, for for also bioassay development and validation and we currently have quite a few strategic links to uk universities uh, and we have a track record of delivering quite complex projects uh, which also has been recently uh, recognized with a few uh, pharmaceutical uh, awards here in the uk um so over the years, um, uh, we at Cellmatics have developed, optimized and validated quite a few um, uh, uh, assays to, for clinically relevant in vitro diseases. And we have uh, five major therapeutic focuses. So we focus on oncology, inflammation, uh, immune oncology, respiratory um, and immunology um, uh, assays. And we offer uh, quite, a few, uh, quite a range of preclinical services to support uh, drug discovery projects. And this includes cell biology assays, uh, phenotype-based imaging, analytical and molecular assays, contract cell culture, and customized assay development. And I left this for last, uh, for the assay development, because we have recently developed an in-house uh, assay for InCell Western. So, why uh, is in, what is an incel western? So I like to call incel western basically a western blood on a dish, uh, because it has that specificity of uh, using the western blood to target uh, or to, and to quantify uh, proteins uh, of interest, but also has the the advantage of having the throughput of an ELISA. Uh, which obviously gives the overall uh, quantification of proteins, but gives that advantage of having a more high throughput way of, of uh, looking at your targets, which obviously is very highly desirable uh, when uh, doing disco uh, drug discovery projects. Uh, and this high throughput manner is because unlike a classical Western blood, which you, you need to do SDS page, um, this relies on 96 wells or 384 well plates. Uh, which then you uh, go through process, uh, uh, kind of standardized protocols to fix permeabilize and go through immunostaining of your desired uh, protein targets. Um, to uh, first uh, study or to f first test this assay, uh, so we adapted the pure mycin incorporation assay. So I'm just going to give a very brief overview of what this assay is. Uh, so basically, uh, pure mycin is an antibiotic. Uh, let me just put the little pointer. So pyromycin is an antibody that um, basically binds to nascent polypeptides uh, as uh, these polypeptides exit the ribosome. So basically it prematurely ends the, the, the elongation of these peptides, but also lab in, it labels them. So the longer or depending on the time that you treat your cells um, with pyromycin, there will be, a, there will be a, a correlation to how many of these polypeptides have been labeled. So obviously uh, that, all, that uh, it clearly represents an overall rate of protein synthesis. Uh, and can quantify uh, protein synthesis. And right now, mostly academic papers uh, rely on this technique uh, with either Western blood or or even immunofluorescence and give a, to give a full relative uh, quantification of this pure mycin signal that gives you rates of protein synthesis. But why is protein synthesis important to look at? So uh, protein synthesis is, um, Basically, uh, it regulates, it's regulated upon cellular stress, and it's very important to reprogram homeostasis to uh, when confronted with stress. Uh, and one of these uh, mechanisms that's very well known is, for instance, the integrated stress response, uh, that when uh, the cell senses stress, the integrated stress response by phosphorylated one, a, a key initiation factor, inhibits this protein synthesis so that the cell can reprogram itself for homeostasis. And obviously, uh, the, the translation of uh, looking at protein synthesis is because it's very well known that it's deregulated in a lot of, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, but also cancer. So obviously, if we can have a way of having a platform that uh, that cl uh, client compounds or compounds that people are interested, that it's known to regulate or target protein synthesis and have a high through, uh, throughput platform that can quantify this and look at the effect of these compounds, that would be obviously advantageous for drug discovery projects. 
And so to study, uh, to look at uh, the validity of a high throughput um, assay for this uh, pyromycin, we here in Salomatics, we've used uh, two reference compounds. So we use chemical stressors like thopsigargin uh, to induce the R stress that leads to the phosphorylation of this initiation factor and then in inhibits protein synthesis. Uh, but then we also, as a sort of reference compound, uh, we use an, a very well-known and very well-documented inhibitor that stops this effect of thopsigargin, so basically reverses the effect of thopsigargin and then restores protein synthesis. So uh, we've adapted a high throughput assay by adapting a pure mycin incorporation assay, the Incel Western, and as a readout of this assay, we went with chemiluminescence. So to start with, we wanted to actually validate um, these reference compounds. So as I said, pure mycin labels all uh, nascent, poly, uh, all nascent proteins. So basically, if you do a Western blood, you would get a smear like this one as shown here of all the, the labeled proteins. What happens then is that when you apply the thopsigargin, for instance, you have a decrease of this signaling, which means that protein synthesis was inhibited, which is which was expected. And then when we apply the inhibitor in a concentration dependent manner, we see this restoration of protein synthesis again on a dose dependent manner. So we see that the reference compounds were validated. But obviously this was done through Western blood, which gives the obvious disadvantage of being a very low throughput assay because it can go up to only 15 samples. So obvi obviously for drug discovery projects, this is not optimal or is not ideal at all. So what we did was completely adapt this assay, but in a 96 well plate where we used, again, the Alliance Q9 from UV Tech and a, a protocol that we optimized here at Salomatics. Uh, where for this case we use 96 well plates, but it could be uh, used for 384 well plates as well, where again we get this the same kind of uh, translational uh, values that we got from a low throughput assay into a more high throughput assay. And then obviously when we graph this, we validated uh, this assay. So we performed this assay in triplicate and we performed um, in three independent experiments and we saw the expected readouts that we would get if we use the classical Western, which was that if we use topsy you see a decrease of the signal. So you can see it very clearly here that the signal has decreased uh, when we use the, the stress in inducer. And then when we apply increasing concentrations of the inhibitor, uh, we see that there is a very clear uh, concentration dependent uh, increase of this protein of this pure mycin signal, which then ultimately uh, saturated at the highest at the three highest concentration. And obviously, when we graph this for pharmacological uh, reasons, we see that we get this classical sigmoidal curve uh, that is expected first expected and goes according to literature. Uh, but that it's been valid, that it's clearly robust and quite reproducible, again, because we repeated this um, for three independent uh, experiments. Um, but because we wanted to confirm that uh, this not only this was not, not only that we want to validate this assay, uh, we wanted to use a second readout uh, that didn't rely on uh, just the, the imaging itself of the blood. Uh, we wanted a, a second equipment to validate this, so we used uh, a micro a reader because obviously this is chemiluminescent signal. So we anticipated that if we put this on a plate reader that reads luminescence, we would get a, a very similar, if not the same, kind of pattern of results. And we were actually quite surprised that not only did we get the same pattern of results that Thopsigargin inhibited, uh, uh, that the reference basically the reference compounds and the controls worked as it should, but that these results, these readouts had a very strong correlation where we see that the HRP, so the chemiluminescent signal from the blood, had a very strong correlation uh, with the luminescent signal from the microplate reader. And obviously after graphing this, we have almost like a copycat of the results that I showed you previously. So we see the classical reduction of the pure mycin signal with the stress inducer. And then with the reference compound to rescue this, we see again this rest this saturation uh, of the uh, of because of the inhibitor. And again, the sigmoidal curve for uh, of the concentration dependent curve. 
And when, for instance, when we uh, 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 overlap these two together, we get essentially the same kind of uh, the same pharmacological parameters. So in red, we have the, the 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 sigmoidal curve that we got from the Alliance Q9, and then the, from the Glomax, we use the Glomax, which is our micro reader in house, and we get almost identical. Uh, uh, pharmacological responses where the IC50 values were conserved, like they stay uh, relatively the same. And then we have a very good goodness of fit, uh, which were very like uh, around 0 0.9. So that is a very good ind indicator that we have a very good uh, concentration response um, uh, curve based on um, this, this uh, treatment with these drugs specifically. So as to summarize uh, here at Salomatics, so we've optimized this in cell Western, but specifically for pure mycin incorporation assay, which obviously is very useful for any drug discovery project related to protein synthesis uh, that can be applied again to neurodegeneration in cancer. We've shown that it's quite robust and reproducible, again, because we repeated this like three times uh, independently and also in triplicate. Uh, we validated this in the Alliance Q9 from UV Tech, so it gave us a, a very good, um, it gave a very good readout with this uh, equipment. But obviously, this being in cell Western, we've only applied for now for pure mycin assay. But this can obviously be applied to a multitude of different protein targets beyond just pure mycin immu immunolabeling. Obviously, would need some sort of obviously we need optimization with it. But this is also something that we can offer. Uh, Base that we've already optimized, like basically the template of the assay itself. So if you have, again, thank you for listening. This was just a very brief overview of what we've done with this assay and the equipment with VTech. Uh, we have our email there. There's the QR code for the website uh, if you want to have a, have a look. And yeah, I'll we'll answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. And, and whilst I'm here, thank you to, to both Sasha and Dr. Hansen for the presentations. Found them very informative. Um, I can't see any questions in the chat. So if anybody has got. I, I actually do for, for Dr. Hansen. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> put you on the spot. So it, was a, it was a very good, very, very well presented. Um, thank you. I actually found it very interesting. And it's important for those who are listening. It's first time someone standardized this kind of protocol on our. On our systems because I did not think it was possible. So just to show how well done. Um, just regarding the them to um, I can't say it correctly, TG, I'm just going to say it. I think it's easier. Mm. The, the, oh, the Thapsi yeah, Garden, yeah. Thapsi Garden. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it, so is that a standard type of, um, you know, a way of determining whether or not protein synthesis is actually inhibited in general? Is that is that just a, a standard type of um, molecular it's assay, a, let's say? It's, it's, it's a very it's a very classical chemical that induces ER stress. So that's that's the key point. So it's okay. obviously a, a chemical and exogenous way of inducing ER stress, which is obviously not the it's not physiologically what happens, but it's a way to induce chemical ER stress, which is what's it's it, it's what's it's important for for neurodegeneration and cancer uh, diseases. It's the fact that it induces ER stress. Um, but there is many other chemicals that do the exact same thing, obviously, perhaps through different pathways or different ways of inducing this. For instance, Thopsy Garden specifically, what it does is releases the calcium storage of the ER and this creates a stress because the, the ER is no longer able to fold proteins. But there's other, other chemicals that do different through different ways that leads eventually to ER stress because that's the ultimate outcome that people tend to look at use these drugs for and then add whatever compounds they're looking at to see if it reverses the effects of the, the in this case the er stress or what the er stress is causing in this mm -hmm. case for protein synthesis but again er stress causes a, another multitude of different yeah. like outcomes and downstream targets beyond protein synthesis this is just one of them and, and having having the having been able to standardize this protocol, have uh, have you and Salomatics decided what the next steps in terms of for your with these biases that you've made? What's what's the next step in terms of uh, well, verification? So definitely the next step we see want to see if this assay can be done in three uh, three hundred and four plates because we haven't done that yet. Because um, okay. obviously that would give an, that would be the ultimate high throughput uh, platform for it. Um, mm -hmm. We also want to test, so I've been wanting to test the the possibility of using epifluorescence on it, uh, but the plates seem to be uh, be an issue with it uh, because of their own autofluorescence. I've tried a different kind of plates because obviously mm. one of the 
even though this assay is really good to look at protein synthesis, um, it, it's in its way, it's only able to do one target at a time again because the readout is chemiluminescence. So yes. if we use epifluorescent, <laughs> we could use, we could multiplex it for looking, for instance, at protein synthesis and other targets. So yes. that's always, that would be a, a, a better way to do it because you could multiplex it. But again, that's something we're trying to um, optimize first in uh, in-house because there seems to be some, there's still, there seems to be some sort of still limitations with the plates itself. And, and my last question is in terms of the acquisition itself, the acquisition images that you've taken recently, mm -hmm. how, how long and uh, have those images taken to get? Uh, is it a few minutes in terms of? It's li it's a little less than a second. I think, oh, wow. I think either it's once, I think I've gotten once, I'm, I can't remember if it's 0 0.8 seconds or 1.8 seconds, but it's definitely below two seconds. Like I've never okay. had to wait, I've never had to wait two seconds to get like a full readout of within the UV tech equipment. Wow. It's very like, it's very efficient and with okay. very low, um, very low background and very and extremely specific. So it does not cut any sort of background from the plastic of the of the plates. Like you just get the staining of the cells itself, and not not even the ed, the the edges of the well. So it's it's extremely specific, which was quite yes. surprising. Thank you. No, thanks. I, I've got more questions, but I, yeah. I, I think I'll, in case anyone else has got questions, I might mm. might let it go. But thank you. Mm, sorry. Thanks both. I can't see any other questions in the chat uh, just now, but in case anybody wants to ask questions sort of outside of this forum, um, the SLS contact details should be on the invite and we can either sort of pass you on to UV Tech or indeed Cellematics if, if, if that's necessary. But thanks again, guys, for the presentation. Um, I found it really informative. And as I said at the start, this webinar has been recorded, so I will make it available to all participants as well. Fantastic. Thank you. No, thank you Amazing. very much. Perfect. Thanks everyone for the time. Uh, thank, thank you for the invite. <laughs>